Our reading comes from 2 Kings, chapter 11. You can find that on page uh, 380. Three hundred and eighty. And before we do that, let's pray. We thank you, Lord, that you are a speaking God. And this morning, as your people, we are gathered here and pray that you may speak to each and every one of us. May you speak to us through the preaching of your word. Amen. When Adaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she proceeded to destroy the whole royal family. But Jehosheba, the daughter of King Jehoram, and sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, son of Ahaziah, and sold him away from among the royal princes who were, among, who were about to be murdered. She put him and his nurse in a bedroom to hide him from Adaliah. So he was not killed. He remained hidden with his nurse at the temple of the Lord for six years while Adaliah ruled the land. In the seventh year, Jehoiada sent for the commanders of units of a hundred, the Karites, and guards, and had them brought to him at the temple of the Lord. He made a covenant with them and put them under oath at the temple of the Lord. Then he showed them the king's son, he commanded them, saying, This is what you are to do. You who are in the three companies that are going on duty on the Sabbath, a third of you guarding the royal palace, a third at the Sar gate, and a third at the gate behind the guard, who take turns guarding the temple, and you who are in the other two companies that normally go off uh, Sabbath duty, are all to guard the temple for the king. Station yourself around the king, each of you with weapon in, his, in, in hand. Anyone who approaches your ranks is to be put to death. Stay close to the king wherever he goes. The commanders of units of a hundred did just as Jeho Jehoiada the priest ordered. Each one took his men, those who were going on duty on the Sabbath, those who were going off duty, and came to Jehoiada the priest. Then he gave the commanders the spears, the shields, that had belonged to King David and that were in the temple of the Lord. The guards, each with weapon in hand, stationed themselves around the king near the altar and the temple from the south side to the north side of the temple. Jehoiada brought out the king's son and put the crown on him. He presented him with a copy of the covenant and proclaimed him king. They anointed him and the people clapped their hands and shouted, Long live the king. Then, when Adaliah heard the noise made by the guards and the people, she went to the people at the temple of the Lord. She looked, and there was the king, standing by the pillar, as the custom was. The officers and the tra trumpeters were be beside the king, and all the people of the land were rejoicing and blowing trumpets. Then Adaliah tore her robes and called out, Treason, treason! Jehoiada the priest ordered the commanders of units of a hundred who were in charge of the troops, bring her out be between the larynx and put the sword anyone who follows her. For the priest had said, she must not be put to death in the temple of the Lord. So they seized her as she reached the place where the horses entered the palace grounds, and there she, she was put to death. Jehoiada then made a covenant between uh, the Lord and the king and people, that they would be the Lord's people. He also made a covenant between the king and the people. All the people of the land went to the temple of Baal and tore it down. They smashed the altars and idols to pieces and killed Matan, the priest of Baal, in front of the altars. Then Jehoiada the priest posted guards at the temple of the Lord. He took with him the commanders of hundreds, the Karites, the guards, and all the people of the land, Together they brought, uh, they brought the king down from the temple of the Lord and went to the palace, entering by way of the gate of the guards. The king then took his place on the royal throne. All the people of the Lord rejoiced, and the city was calm because Adaliah 
had been slain with a sword at the palace. Joash was seven years old when he, when he began his reign. Ephraim, thanks very much. Good morning from me and uh, welcome. Uh, lovely to be here today, despite uh, COVID, the weather, Christmas and just about everything else. Um, please keep uh, 2 Kings uh, chapter 11 open in front of you. The lady who saved Christmas. Are we talking about a lady in the government uh, who has stepped up and saved Christmas by persuading the government to keep things open? Actually, we're not, uh, although we are glad that things are open. This is a true story about a lady you may never have heard of who lived something like 2,800 years ago. In fact, the exact date, 841 to 835 years before Christ. And she saved Christmas for us. Oh, somebody says, well, Christmas wasn't invented then. How could she save Christmas? Well, wait and see. Now, I need two willing volunteers who are happy to come, and not to do anything embarrassing, but just to be two ends of a long piece of string. Can I find two willing Ah, oh, yes, thank you so much. Come and do the, uh, the string thing. Right, one at one end and one at the other. If you stay here and you let that turn around, go all the way down to the door at the other end, one long piece of string. Give your sister a chance. <laughs> okay. That's it, a long piece of string. We'll see in a minute what this string is about. All the way to the door. Okay. Now, let's have the next picture, please. Our story begins some years before uh, the story of the lady who saved Christmas with King David. He was one of the very greatest of the kings of God's people, Israel. And the biggest thing that happened during King David's reign is one of the things that's not very well known. It's not, in fact, the story of David and Goliath. Um, it's actually a promise that God made to King David. He actually said, the Lord God said to King David, your royal line will rule the people, my people forever. Your throne will last forever. In other words, from David would come a son, and then a grandson, then a great-grandson, and God would make sure that that line would last forever and rule over his people forever. It's an extraordinary thing for God to have promised. And this line is like, this piece of string, here we are, is like the royal line of David, stretching all the way through history. Should we make the line nice and tight? Just tighten it up so that it's, uh, that's, ah, oh, great. And all the way from King David onwards, from that promise, there was an expectation amongst God's people that one day a very great king would come from that line who would rule forever. But then, and this is what happens in our story, somebody came along who wanted to cut that line. In 841 BC, one of King David's descendants called Ahaziah was wounded in a battle and he died in a place called Megiddo. And that's where we pick up the story. When Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she proceeded to destroy the entire royal Family. Now, the pictures we're seeing today are drawn by various different members of my family. I think it's a pretty good likeness here of Athaliah. She was pretty nasty, and she wanted to destroy the entire royal line. It's not exactly obvious why she wanted to do that, but putting two and two together, almost certainly, it's because she wanted to keep power for herself, and she would kill off all the rivals. Those kinds of things happen. Uh, there was a time in the 1380s in England when uh, the two princes in the tower were murdered so that a different uh, man could retain power. And it's happened in some other countries of the world. I think in the ruling family in North Korea, there's been a bit of killing of other members of the family to keep the leader in power. These kinds of things happen. And she went through the entire royal line, all the other possible contenders for the throne, all the descendants of Amazar, and started to kill them. Let's... Uh, Let's see her do that. So it's a bit like 
Queen Athaliah comes out with a big pair of scissors, and she's killed all of the royal line, except for just one, who's a little baby called Joash. Is the promise to David going to be fulfilled? Is it going to be possible for David's descendants to be on the throne, uh, looking after God's people forever? Thank you so much. That's that. So, you can put it down. <laughs> okay. Now, there was one little prince who wicked Queen Athaliah hadn't managed to get her hands on, who is Ahaziah's tiny son, Joash. Let's see the next picture. And if we look at verse 2, it says, But Jehosheba, the daughter of King Jehoram and the sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, who was her nephew, away from among the royal princes who were about to be murdered. She put him and his nurse in a bedroom to hide him from Athaliah, so he wasn't killed. I wonder if you've ever heard of Jehosheba before. Well, at this one moment, this lady was very, very important. She was the sister of the king who'd been killed. Her brother had left a tiny son called Joash, who was only one. All the other royal princes were being murdered, but she stole him away. And uh, with his nurse, she went into the temple and found a room at the back somewhere, and she hid him there, so he was absolutely safe. It seems the temple was a place where wicked Queen Athaliah didn't go. Meanwhile, next picture, Wicked Queen Athaliah continued to rule the land. Verse 3. Joash remained hidden in, with his nurse in the temple of the Lord for six years while Athaliah ruled the land. She was in charge. She was doing lots of horrible things. She was encouraging worship of the wrong gods, the Baals, uh, not the, the true and living God. She was destroying all the royal princes and the royal line, wanting to keep power for herself. But little did she know, next picture, that in the temple, little Joash was hidden with his nurse and growing up. Now, it turns out that in the temple, there was a man who was also on the side of the living God. His name was Jehoiada. There he is, the high priest. He was a good man. He knew the Lord. He didn't like what Queen Athaliah was doing, and he bravely did the right thing. And eventually, after six years, he got the army to commanders together from around the country. Verse 4, In the seventh year, Jehoiada sent for the commanders of units of a hundred, the Karaites and the guards who had been brought to him at the temple of the Lord. He made a covenant to them and put them under oath. So, you're sworn to secrecy, he said. Uh, and then he showed them the king's son. Can you imagine him bringing out this uh, little boy uh, who by now is uh, coming on seven years of age? And he commanded them, saying, This is what you're to do. You are in the three companies that are going on duty in the Sabbath, a third of you, guard, a third of you guarding the royal palace, a third at the Sir Gate, and a third at the gate behind the guard, who take turns guarding the temple. So he pitched a guard round the temple. I said the drawings were by members of my family. You can see which one was drawn by me. Uh, he pitched a guard of soldiers all round the temple. And then what he did was he brought little Joash, aged nearly seven, out in front of everybody. And uh, he said, uh, long live the king. And the whole crowd shouted, long live the king. Let's, uh, now we can see Joash. Why don't we say that together? Ready, steady. Long live the king. So, the shouting, the noise of the shouting reached Queen Athaliah in the royal palace. And she's thinking, Hang on, I thought I was in charge of this country. And she's very, very angry, and she comes out tearing her clothes and shouting, treason, treason. Even her hair seems to have turned blue through the stress of the experience. Or perhaps they just had blue rinses in those days. I don't know, but anyway. She was very, very upset. But Jehoiada and the soldiers were not going to give in. Next picture. They took... Queen Athaliah away and killed her and proclaimed Joash as the king. What a relief. Now, 
the country had a king who followed the Lord. The royal line had been preserved. The piece of string had not been cut. And the story goes on down the different descendants of Joash all the way to a stable in Bethlehem. Next picture. Mary and Joseph going to Bethlehem and having baby Jesus. So next picture. The lady who saved Christmas was called Jehoshaphat. It's not a household name, but she played a very important part in God's plans. And while we're doing the credits, we might as well give thanks for Jehoiada as well. He's not a household name either, but he did the right thing. So there's a lady and a gentleman who saved Christmas for us. That's how we were able to have Christmas. God kept his promise. The royal line continued, and a son of David was born in the house and line of David one day, Uh, 840 years later, 2,000 years ago before today, in Bethlehem. Well, that's the story of the lady who saved Christmas. But we need to ask the question, what's this got to do with you and me? Well, let's sing a song first. It's a lovely song, and I think we've got some more actions uh, which uh, which go with the song all through history. Let's enjoy singing that together. And I'll clear out of the space of where the actioners are. Now, what does this true story have uh, to tell us? Uh, Well, let's let's have a look at some more pictures on the screen and uh, three things to learn. There are probably more things to learn, but let me draw out three things to learn from this story uh, of the lady who saved Christmas. And here's the first. It is that the king God sends is always opposed. Let's have the next picture. If we can have it. uh, There it is. So, there is uh, wicked Queen Athaliah. God wanted Joash to rule his people. That was how he was going to fulfill his promise to David, made centuries earlier. But Athaliah did not want God's choice of king to rule. She wanted to rule herself. She wanted to keep the crown on her own head. And you know what? That's a pattern which goes on through the Bible. Do you remember when God sent his son, uh, the Lord Jesus, into the world? There was a king then called Herod. Here's a a picture of, uh, supposed to be a picture of Herod the Great. He didn't want somebody else to rule over the people of God either. He wanted to keep the crown on his own head. And do you remember there's a horrible story that Matthew tells us in his gospel, which is the story that Herod actually wanted to kill all the uh, babies in Bethlehem and the toddlers up to the age of two, all the little boys, because he didn't want... Uh, this other one to become king. Do you know the whole story of the Bible is the story of a great battle? Right back in Genesis chapter 3, um, God speaks to the serpent who has deceived Adam and Eve and talks about a conflict that's going to come between him, uh, between the, the woman's seed, who's going one day to be the king that God sends, and uh, the serpent who stands for the devil. And the whole Bible is the story of God working to rescue a people or make them his own, but constant conflict, constant attack, constant opposition all the way through. Sometimes from people, sometimes directly from the devil himself. And that's been the story of the history of the church as well, all down the centuries. If you ever read about the stories of the true story of Christian people down the 2,000 years since the Lord Jesus. There's been constant attack, opposition, difficulty, dark days, days when uh, churches have been under pressure of one kind or another, sometimes persecution, sometimes false teaching, sometimes just uh, going off the boil one way or another. Let's have the next picture. This is a sad picture of some ladies comforting each other after their church, which is in the Middle East, had been blown up by some terrorists who hated Christians. And every year in the last hundred years, there have been Christians around the world who've been killed for their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We can expect that even here in peaceful Britain, there will be people who try to stop the Lord's plans and try to stop his work. Our country has lots going on which is against the Lord Jesus, trying to discredit him and making it difficult for us to tell other people about him. And one of the things that this story reminds us of is it raises the question, are you ready for that? Are you actually ready for uh, 
uh, difficulties for God's people of one kind or another. It helps us to read the Bible because it readies us for that. We look back and we see there's been a great conflict all the way through from Genesis 3 onwards and uh, we can uh, expect it when it comes. We don't know what form it'll take, but it will come. That seems like bad news, but here's some really good news. The next point is this. God sticks to his plans. Do you remember a few minutes ago, we had Arthur down at the far end of the church. We had Victoria here and a long piece of string connecting these two. And I came out with that nasty pair of scissors, like Queen Athaliah, to cut the line. And you think all is doom and gloom and the promise of God, uh, uh, God won't be able to keep his promises, but he sticks to his plans. And of course, eight and a half centuries after this true story, the Lord Jesus was born, who came and lived and died on a cross and rose again in power and sent his spirit. And from that time on, there's been an increasing number of his followers all down through history. Have a look at this, this next picture. I love this one. This is a kind of worldwide picture of Christians. I found different pictures in different places around the world. The top left-hand picture is a pic- picture of a lot of people being baptised. I think it's in... Uh, 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 Ethiopia or Sudan, uh, in huge numbers, uh, in a lake there. Uh, We've got a a baptistry here, but we've never had as many as that in one go. Can you imagine it? God's people all over the world. One of the wonderful things is that 20 centuries after the coming of the Lord Jesus, we can see that God is building for himself a multitude of people that no one can count. And actually, next picture, that's what God promises uh, uh, that we can look forward to, that great multitude uh, in heaven. At Difficult times, we wonder who's going to be the winner, but be assured that the Bible tells us that God will certainly be the winner. God sticks to his plans. But here's the point. Along the way, he uses ordinary people like us to fulfill his promises, people who trust in his promises, like Jehoshaphat. We've never heard of her before, possibly until today, and we won't think much about her again. She doesn't come much in the Bible, but she was the right person in the right place in the right time. And the reason that our church is here today, and we can still meet, and we're still meeting to hear from Jesus, is because God has been looking after us. He's used lots of people over the years who've served him and looked after his work here. There have sometimes been difficult days, but he's kept us so that we can keep on making the great news about the Lord Jesus made known to others. God sticks to his plans. And one day there will be that glorious gathering in heaven with a multitude more than anyone can number, all worshipping the king that God sent in fulfilment of his promise, the Lord Jesus. One last point to take on board, and that's this. God's work is sometimes hidden. I mean, honestly, during those six years when Queen Athaliah was ruling the land, uh, you'd have uh, looked on your phone at the news or picked up a newspaper and you'd have seen the latest stuff that Athaliah was doing. You'd have seen her sending around her her troops and things like this uh, and uh, establishing the Baal-worshipping temples around the land. And you just thought, well, it's... It's as bad as the Ashes cricket for the cause of uh, of God. It's it's just gone. Um, Congratulations to those of you Australians. We haven't finished yet, but um, (laughs) it looked pretty bad. And God's work is sometimes hidden. You see, the thing is, what Queen Athaliah didn't know was that over in the temple, this little boy was being looked after, who was the rightful heir to the throne, backed by the promises of God. What she didn't know when she thought she was the winner was that one day she would absolutely be the loser. Do you know, it's just so in the days of Jesus. I keep marvelling every Christmas at that passage in Luke chapter 1 where Caesar Augustus issues a decree that the whole world uh, would enrol for a census. He was a man of unbelievable power. He was the emperor of Rome, the first emperor of Rome, and all he has to do is click his fingers and everybody has to go to their hometown to register. Millions and millions of people. And that's what the newspapers would have been full of. But in an outhouse in Bethlehem, a child was being born who would not have registered in the newspapers at all. I doubt his parents could even have afforded to put a post, a birth announcement for him. But there he was, 
And he was the one who became the savior of the world and the ultimate ruler. See, God's work is sometimes hidden. God specializes in that. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. And yet, who's done more to change the world, Caesar Augustus or Jesus? Well, let's see the next picture. Uh, there we are. There's, uh, uh, that, that is uh, Jehosheba. And this Christmas, God's people are under pressure. Jesus' work is opposed. Churches are sometimes struggling, but God is, work, is at work. And the story the world doesn't hear is that worldwide millions of people are becoming followers of Jesus. And one day he will come back in power. And those who stood against him will be in trouble. But those who stood with him will rejoice. Those are the three things to learn from this story, this true story. First of all, God's work is opposed. Secondly, God always sticks to his plans. Thirdly, God's work is sometimes hidden. Now, can anybody now... This is a bit of a test for our brains, which are fairly fogged up probably after the last 24 hours. Can anybody remember the name of the lady who saved Christmas? Jehoshaphat. Thank you very much. Arthur, you were going to get it, weren't you? Yeah, so Jehoshaphat is the lady who saved Christmas. Just remember her. She's a lovely example to us. And actually, let's, let's give due credit to Jehoiada, the high priest as well. They're lovely examples to us of people who knew the living God, who didn't believe that the game was up, who didn't believe that Queen Athaliah should be allowed to continue, who knew that ultimately, above and beyond Queen Athaliah, the Lord God was ruling on his throne from heaven, and that he should have his way, that he should be honoured, and they were willing to be brave and to take action and to stand on his side. Imagine the trouble they'd have been in if they'd been caught. But they were prepared to trust God, take the risk, and on the due time, they brought little King Joash out. And it's a, it's a wonderful true story to challenge us, which, whose side are we on? And when the whole world seems to be sometimes following in a different direction from the direction of the Lord Jesus Christ, are we willing still to stand with him and be on his side? That's a great thing to ask ourselves as we head for 2022. And we remember from this story that that is the sensible place to be because the Lord God always, always sticks to his plans and has his way. Shall we have a prayer together? Thank you, Lord, that you always keep your promises, even though at times your work can seem hidden. And thank you, too, that you use ordinary people like Jehoshaphat to do your work and Jehoiada. Please help us today to be brave for you like she was, trusting you, and knowing that one day you will be the winner. Amen.